Before we honor our 2013 nurse researchers, I would like to recognize previous International Nurse Researcher Hall of Fame honorees who are with us today. So if there's any one of you here in the audience, I would ask you please stand so that we can recognize you. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> the International Nurse Researcher Hall of Fame honors Sigma Theta Tau International's members who have achieved significant and sustained national and or international recognition for their work and whose research has impacted the profession and the people it serves. Today, we are honoring 19 distinguished nurse researchers. The honorees were selected by an appointed review panel with exemplar research expertise. Each nomination included documentation that provided evidence of their contribution and impact on nursing research as it's outlined in the criteria of the award. All but two of our honorees are here with us today. Dr. Barbara Daly and Dr. Catherine Lee, who is both from the United States of America. And they send their regrets as they could not join us today. The presentation of the International Nurse Researcher Hall of Fame is sponsored by Wiley. And on behalf of Sigma Theta Tau International Board of Directors, I thank Wiley for its continued support um, at this event. Wiley works with STTI staff and editors to publish our two journals, which is the Journal of Nursing Scholarship, as well as Worldviews on Evidence-Based Nursing. And at this time, I would like to welcome to the podium Gr Griselda Campbell from Wiley. Thanks, Griselda. Thank you, Dr. Klopper. I'm honored to be here representing Wiley in my capacity as International Director for our Nursing Publishing. Wiley is proud of its long association with Sigma Theta Tau International and our long-term commitment and support nationally and internationally of nursing scholarship. Firstly, I'd like to recognize Sigma Theta Tau International's achievement in creating this amazing annual event, which is both inspirational and aspirational. Secondly, and most importantly, I would like to recognize the achievements of our 19 distinguished nurse researchers as they join the other honorees in the Hall of Fame. I look forward to this opportunity, as I'm sure all of you are, to meeting the recipients in person and to gain insight into what has inspired them along their journey. Wiley is honored to support this presentation, which recognizes each recipient's outstanding contribution to nursing and beyond. Thank you. Well, thank you, Griselda. And our thanks once again to Wiley for sponsoring this presentation. Now I invite Sigma Theta Tau International President, Dr. Suzanne Prevo to the stage for the presentation of the International Nurse Researcher Hall of Fame honorees. I will introduce each one of them in alphabetical order and invite them to then join on the stage. Time does not allow me to give a, chroni a chronicle overview and the achievements of the honorees, but you may access more of the details and abstracts of their work in the Virginia Henderson International Nursing Library. After all the honorees have been introduced, then President Prevo will post questions to them, that, and those questions were submitted in advance by the Congress attendees, through either the website or through Twitter. And now it's my privilege then to introduce to you the 2013 International Nurse Researcher Hall of Fame honorees. And the first one is Dr. Karen Arroyan. She's <laughs> Karen is internationally renowned for her research on immigrant and minority health her research career spans more than three decades and has yielded numerous publications, research grants, and awards. She has influenced how care is delivered to immigrants and minority, particularly with regard to assessing psychological distress and delivering cultural sensitive care. 
The substantive knowledge generated by Dr. Arroyans concerns three interrelated areas in immigrants and minorities, which is psychosocial adaptation, accessibility, and utilization of healthcare, as well as cultural health belief practices and values. Her research has increased knowledge and has made an impact on the profession, patients, families, and communities, as well as on policy at the institutional and public levels. Her research has been translated into Russia, Spanish, Arabic, and Chinese. Our next honoree, Dr. Victoria Champion, Champion has developed a program of research that has an impact on the profession of nursing and on healthcare practice and policy in the United States. Her research has led to scientific <laughs> knowledge that has been translated into practice and provided a framework within which she, was, she has mentored many developing scientists. Dr. Champion's research has focused on the identification and testing of interventions to enhance compliance with screening behaviors and related to early diagnosis of breast cancer. Dr. Champion has shown that cognitive and behavioral toileting or tailoring interventions do increase screening adherence and that these interventions can be translated through various technologies. She has identified important constructs for use in tailoring interventions to increase cancer screening behaviors. <laughs> Dr. Sally Chan has built a research ag agenda focusing on community health, mental health, perinatal mental health, and older adult mental health, as well as nursing education. Dr. Chan's research on patients and family caregivers, focusing on quality of life, symptom management, care burden, as well as scoping. Her team has developed multiple community interventions for people with mental health conditions and their families, and programs to promote mental health. Her research has responded to national health care needs in Singapore and focused on dementia care for patients and their family caregivers and psychological care of people with chronic illnesses. In perinatal health, she, con she collaborated with others from Hong Kong, China, Singapore, and Australia on qualitative and quantitative studies on antenatal psychoeducation, social support, interpersonal psychotherapy, and learned resourcefulness. <laughs> Dr. Sandra Dunbar has devoted her nursing career to cardiovascular care in the United States. Her research exploring the psychosocial effect of cardiac illnesses and the promotion of health and well-being for caregivers and her efforts to improve outcomes for heart failure patients is nationally recognized. Her work in the area of heart failure has, as its central focus, examination of strategies by which individuals might, through knowledge, enhance knowledge and informed behavior, better manage their lives and their chronic diseases. Dr. Dunbar's work examines how nursing interventions ranging from education to nutritional counseling might improve the functioning, the mood, and the quality of life of persons affected by heart failure, or treated for it through various means such as implantable cardiac defibrillators. <laughs> Dr. Susan Gennaro has conducted research on the antecedents and consequences of stress of preterm birth on infants and families. Specifically, her research has provided knowledge of the cost burden to families of having a preterm infant, the impact of stress on the postpartum care for the preterm infant, as well as the knowledge about how stress and immune changes resulting from stress are implemented and implicated in preterm birth. <laughs> Her research in the United States, Malawi, Uganda, Belgium, Switzerland, India, and the Ukraine has been utilized to help decrease maternal mortality, translate perinatal knowledge, and improve perinatal care by implementing evidence-based programs to increase paternal involvement in childbirth and increasing the role of the neonatal nurse.
Dr. Ma Margaret Heitkemper, research addresses irritable bowel syndrome and has, has integrated basic science research with nursing science and has evolved into the development of biobehavioral interventions for symptom management in the United States. She has changed the dialogue about IBS from one of the psychosomatic disorders to one about a functional GI disturbance for which self-management approaches to self symptom management coupled with indicated medical and pharmacological interventions are now regarded as optimal therapy. Dr. Heitkemper's methods have expanded nurses, nurse researchers' visions of nurse science to incorporate some of the most recently developed dynamics and study designed elements into her work. Her contributions have advanced deep understanding of IBS and visceral pain with an emphasis on empowering those living with IBS to manage their symptoms and to live an enhanced quality of life. As a nurse and midwife and epidemiologist, Dr. Anne Kurth's work evaluates information and communication technology and other approaches for health intervention implementation, care, workforce training, as well as for productive health, HIV, and chronic disease prevention in management in East Africa, United States, and other parts globally. She's the principal investigator, co-investigator, and consultant on studies currently underway in the United States, Uganda, Kenya, uh, Ghana, Tanzania, Rwanda, India, <coughs> Republic of Georgia, and Peru. She has consulted on research methodologies for the World Health Organization, the United States Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, as well as the Gates Foundation. Dr. Kurth established one of the first advanced practice nurse-managed HIV clinics in the Midwest of the United States and a model that is now being utilized around the world. <laughs> Dr. Yu Her Lai is well known by nursing and interdisciplinary health professionals in Taiwan for her expertise in cancer nursing cancer education, and research related to some supportive oncology. The overall research direction aim is to identify can cancer patients and caregivers distressed and related care needs, as well as the quality of life that further develop and test intervention to decrease distress and enhance quality of life. Pain and fatigue are the two major care problems. Dr. Lee has identified. Due to an increase in her oral, head, neck, and then lung cancers, she has targeted more on these populations of the inpatient distress. Dr. Lai has developed her research with three major branch, branches, which is pain-related problems, as well as the management thereof, cancer-related fatigue series studies, and the third component, cancer care, needs as well as the quality of life. <laughs> Dr. Mari Pochampul has contributed to nursing research in South Africa and internationally through her research projects, work supervision of graduate candidates and mentoring of colleagues. Most probably as a side remark, I may add that she has mentored more than 100 PhDs to completion. During the past 12 years, her research focus has been on ag aggression on, in secondary schools and in the South African society that has included the development, implementation, evaluation, and psychoeducational programs and the management of aggression, and then to facilitate mental health of individuals and communities. Throughout her career, Mari has assisted in providing capacity building of nurse researchers in South Africa, Jordan, Namibia, Swaziland, and conducted workshops throughout Southern Africa uh, 
on qualitative and quantitative research methodology, theory development, postgraduate supervision, as well as publication of articles. <laughs> Dr. Therese Richmond is known for her research in post-injury disability and firearm violence in the United States. Her research addresses the correlation between physical in injury, age, and the psycho psychological aftermath of the in injury as an indicative contributor to the decreased post-injury function. These issues and concern which touched her during her more than 25 years of being a practicing clinician have helped pinpoint groups of injured patients most likely to encounter inadequate outcomes and led to screening and interventions to improve these outcomes. One such example is reflected in a recently completed five-year study examining the effects of developing depression and post-traumatic stress disorder after an injury that resulted in a disability. In this study, Dr. Richmond developed a predictive screener to identify those patients at highest risk for the future emergence of post-injury depression as well as post-traumatic stress disorder. Dr. Claire Ricketts' research focuses on evidence-based practice in acute and critical care nursing, specializing in the prevention of intravascular device-related bloodstream infection and catheter failure. Her interdisciplinary research team has established respected ties with health research across Australia as well as internationally. Dr. Ricketts' work has been cited in numerous international practical, clinical practice guidelines for IV catheter care, infection prevention, released by Australia, United States, and other health departments, and by esteemed professional organizations. She has demonstrated that peripheral intravenous catheters used in nearly all hospitalized patients can be used longer than the current 72 to 96 hours, which reduces the patient's pain for repeated needle, um, needles and ensures saving in nursing and medical time as well as hospital costs. <laughs> Dr. Letitia Rispel has been more than 20 years within research and her experience spans research, public health and health policy. The aim of her research was to develop and strengthen the evidence for improved nursing policy development and practice in South Africa. She provided leadership for the program that has seen extensive capacity building of the research team in study design methods and project execution. At the same time, the project has engaged actively with the nursing profession and with other health stakeholders, which has influenced the nature and the content of health policy development beyond expectation. Having combined her vast experience of research, public health, executive management, and health leadership, Dr. Rispel is one of the few academic, academics with intimate knowledge and experience in transforming healthcare systems in sub-Saharan Africa. <laughs> Dr. Phyllis Sharps, Research is known for reducing maternal and child health disparities in the United States. Her work to reduce infant mortality amongst African-American women has specifically focused on nurse home visiting strategies to reduce intimate partner violence and abuse against pregnant women. Dr. Sharp's research on best practices for public health nurse home visits to screen for and intervene in partner violence against pregnant women has provided research evidence that has led to federal agencies' recommendations for funding programs that implement universal screening, universal screening as part of home visit programs. Her study is among the first to introduce computer tablets into public health care and nurse home visitation programs. This approach aims to increase the effectiveness of screening for sensitive issues such as partner violence 
and thereby assisting nurses in getting more abused women referred to the appropriate community resources. Dr. Ku Jung Rimshan has conducted research continuously studying the health of women in Korea. She has studied depression, menopause, urinary incon incontinence, mastectomy, osteoporosis, pressure ulcers, fall prevention, successful aging, sleep, and dementia. She has contributed to health promotion programs, implemented her research, and evaluated those programs. <coughs> Dr. Rimshan moves her research forward into policy and practice. And as the president of the Korea Nurses Association, she advocates for nurses in newspapers, magazines, and then reaching the public, as well as um, teaching through health promotion. She uses her influence for change at the national level for a position in health comedies and influence policy right into the Korean parliament. She is poised to elicit change through legislation and policy, and the most effective way to raise standards of health within Korea. <laughs> Dr. Jo Ellen Wilbur's expertise in midlife women's health issues are simultaneously characterized by compassion, clinical adaptness, and scientific rigor. She was one of the first to identify the importance of lifestyle physicality, including leisure time household and occupational physical activity and the impact on women's health. Her major research area of interest is developing cost-effective behavioral change interventions, and it's to increase the physical activity of women. And with specific emphasis on minority populations within the United States. Dr. Wilbur's work expanded the dominant biomedical perspective to include social and behavioral considerations. She has continuously built on this interdisciplinary science, pushing the design and methodological aspects, and building upon this translational knowledge base in working with the underserved minority women. Dr. Ann Williams has designed and conducted some of the earliest studies of AIDS amongst drug users. Her work tested interventions to decrease HIV transmission, improve gynecological care of women living with HIV, and increase patient adherence to antiretroviral medication. Dr. Williams' work in the United States, China, Vietnam, Thailand, and Poland supports the international efforts to limit the spread of HIV and to improve the care of those that are already infected. Currently, she leads a collaborative study on HIV and AIDS medication adherence in China. This study will contribute to successful treatment of HIV around the world through increased understanding of those factors associated with antiretroviral therapy adherence and interventions to improve the adherence as well as the factors associated with resistance to antiretroviral therapy adherence. <laughs> Dr. Nancy Wood's research focuses on women's health, encompassing menstru menstrual cycle symptoms, the menopausal transition, and then healthy aging in older women in the United States. She was one of the first investigators to go beyond the purely <laughs> reproductive aspects of women's health to focus on aspects of well-being during significant transitions in women's lives. Dr. Woods and her colleagues conducted a study documenting the variety of experiences for women and many races and socioeconomic status, as well as the interaction of biological and psychosocial components of transition to a normal life event. She and her group pioneered the methodology of daily diaries to capture these experiences. Her leadership in this area most certainly changed practice in nursing, medicine, and other human services by changing people's perception of the importance of patient reported experiences.
Sigma Theta Tau International has long focused on knowledge development, dissemination, and utilization. These nurse researchers' careers have really demonstrated how exceptional nurse scientists can be successful in all of these areas. Please join me in congratulating the 2013 International Nurse Researcher Hall of Fame honorees. part of the ceremony, and now for the fun part. <laughs> this is one of my favorite events at Sigma Theta Tau. I think we are just so fortunate to have in our midst such tremendous intellectual capital, and it's really an honor to sit here among my esteemed colleagues. I'm sure you feel the same. And we take this opportunity to get to, to know them on a little more personal level, and for each of you to benefit from how they've developed their research careers. So I'm going to ask the um, honorees some questions that have been submitted by our participants and um, give them an opportunity to tell you a little bit about themselves. So um, most of the questions that were submitted um, deal with the interface between research and practice. And some of the members are interested to know how much time these researchers spent in clinical practice before they developed a research career. So we're going to go through and just answer this very quickly. We're going to go down the line, starting with Karen. If you would tell us what was your clinical career and then um, the transition into research. Certainly. My area of clinical practice was psych mental health nursing, particularly in the community. And I spent about five years as a full-time clinician before I came back for my PhD. But then I would work per diem inpatient for a number of years afterwards. And I worked about five years uh, prior to coming back for my PhD. Um, I worked in recovery, intensive care, and then felt like I really became a professional nurse when I went into the outpatient area and had an opportunity to interface with patients and uh, the community in which they lived. I worked for about five years before I moved to education. <laughs> yeah, my specialty is in mental health nursing. But I never considered myself a uh, uh, move away from clinical practice because I am involved with clinical practice in various capacity. For example, teaching student, uh, supervising students in the clinical area. I myself also uh, run a nurse-led clinic uh, that I spend uh, one day or half day a week. And uh, two years ago, I established a unit called Nursing Academic and Practice Excellence, in which the faculty work closely with the clinical staff to identify research agenda and uh, mentoring them to conduct research. So I would consider myself never leave the clinical practice. <laughs> I worked in critical care, emergency department, um, cardiovascular surgery for about um, two years, and then I became uh, during that time, I also uh, went straight through to my master's degree. Um, that was many years before people did that. So um, uh, then went into teaching and taught clinical nursing for about five years before I went back for my doctorate. And I felt like during that time of, of teaching and being a very in intensely involved with students in clinical practice that that um, contributed a lot to uh, some of the problems I saw that I later wanted to study. So talk about different models. I was an English major. <laughs> it took me a little while to decide that that was not what I wanted to do with my life and that I wanted to go to nursing. So I was one of the early um, direct entry group that went with a degree in something else. It was good that I was so confused and did things so poorly because I met my husband in nursing school. <laughs> Where to go to meet a man, I always say. <laughs> and um, then we both practiced in ICUs. I was in labor and delivery. He was in postpartum. I worked in adult ICU and the neonatal intensive care unit. But it became very clear that um, trajectories of how to do things were really changing. And when I went back to UAB, Sandy and I share that, we were very fortunate to have scholars from around the world who came and, and did a residency. And I think it was Ada Jaycox who said, 
you can't do everything every day, but you can do everything in a three or five year period. So I've really <laughs> spent my life making sure that in the next five year plans, I understand how practice, research, et cetera, are going together and happy to share some of that later. Well, I work um, probably a very limited amount of time compared to everybody else, but maybe for about one year. Then I went to graduate school and I got so turned on by research that then I worked for a couple of years as a nurse researcher on a large NIH funded project. Then when I went to get my PhD in physiology, I worked daily with rats. And probably what really helped was working part-time in acute care geriatrics because it reminded me of what all the work I was doing at the bench was really about. It was about helping people. So my first job after training as a direct entry uh, nurse midwife uh, um, was at a 1,300-bed hospital where my mother had worked years before. Of all the hospitals in the country, that's where I landed, and um, started an HIV program there as a clinical nurse specialist because I really couldn't practice as a midwife. This was Indiana. It was not easy to get a job of practicing as a nurse midwife. Uh, but that was a great experience, and I then went on to the state health department there, and really, because I also have population health background, that became my practice was sort of pu public health. And, um, but after about six and a half years of that, I said, I really need to have a PhD um, to be able to really <coughs> integrate research um, into affecting population health. So then I went on to that route. It's my, uh, I have a, a clinical experience of seven years. Uh, three years uh, in the, right after my undergraduate program, and then I went to U.S. Uh, University of Pennsylvania for my master uh, in clinical nurse specialist in oncology program uh, with Dr. Ruth Makoko and Professor Makoko. She gave me a wonderful experience to help me to locate and get sufficient clinical experiences in the, the northeastern part of the USA. So I, I visit and also practice in uh, in uh, probably more than twenty. Uh, hospitals in the eastern side of USA in the oncology part. Then once finished my uh, master one year, then I go back, went back to Taiwan, have uh, two years in the clinical nurse specialist uh, in cancer care experiences and two years uh, in hand nurse in oncology. So with uh, four years uh, preparation before I get, get back to my PhD program. And currently, I still work uh, with the uh, lung cancer team and also uh, hand cancer physicians, surgeons, and radiologists. So we put our uh, master student and also PhD student go to clinical, really work with the patients, the patients' problem, including myself. I'm involved the uh, uh, nurse uh, case manage, cancer case managers. They work uh, once a week and also meeting with them, so I know the, all everything about the hospital and the cancer care, and also the quality control in cancer institute in, in National Taiwan University Hospital. So I also involve some medical situation, so they consult our, our opinion about the supportive care in cancer patients. So I think this part is worthwhile. In, I, would, I, I keep going to put my, my get in, make input on, on our um, uh, cancer, independent cancer hospital in the National Taiwan University Hospital. Thank you. Thank you. Formally, I've spent four and a half years in uh, acute psychiatric care. Informally, I've spent my whole life in facilitating <laughs> mental health. And I especially focus uh, with my postgraduate stu students, masters and PhDs to facilitate the whole persons that they become fully who they are as people to be able to carry that over with all the people they interact with. So my whole life, spent on facilitating <laughs> mental health. I could say something. <laughs> um, I actually, I'm a slow starter, obviously, <laughs> as I listen to everybody. I spent about 13 years full-time in clinical practice before I considered getting a PhD. And I did that because I started asking and doing research when I was a practitioner, and I really didn't know what I was doing. Um, so my clinical practice and the questions I had really pushed me into a PhD program. I really, just for the fun of it, and I worked trauma critical care and neurocritical care, just for the fun of it, every other Friday evening, when it, even when I was on faculty, I'd work in our neuro ICU, just for fun, um, <laughs> to have immediate feedback of, you know, people liked being taken care of. And I did that till about 2003. 
So um, it's always been a part of my life. I still have practice privileges, but I really don't actively practice at this point. Yeah, similar to Terry, maybe I um, was in clinical research. Uh, after, first, I was a clinical nurse for about five years. Then I moved into a sort of joint clinical research uh, with also a clinical work position. Again, with no university affiliation, no master's degree, no PhD, nothing, but was managing and doing and designing numerous studies and thinking, well, this is just what you do in research. So um, eventually, I did go to do my PhD, but I think that period of doing research every day in the clinical setting knowing how to make a project work, knowing how to do a massive trial with no funds at all, has been very helpful for me <laughs> in later life. <laughs> and I think um, I, I continued to do one day a month um, as a clinician until uh, five years ago, but since then I've had two children and a hip replacement, so I haven't really had much spare time, but I have been a patient, so that's definitely <laughs> that um, influenced me. Well, I did an undergraduate degree in nursing, and prior to registration as a nurse and midwife, um, there's a minimum number of hours to be completed in practical hours. So I had the opportunity after graduation and shortly before registration with the South African Nursing Council to work in a critical care unit um, in a children's hospital. And uh, the charge nurse was so impressed with my skills that she asked me to come back uh, to work in the critical care unit. And um, so I went back. Um, and so I broke the, a record because I was the first sort of newly graduate nurse to go straight into a cardiac intensive care unit or critical care unit in a pediatric hospital. I then stayed there for um, two years before I specialized in pediatric nursing. And then I worked for another two years um, as a clinical instructor. Um, so altogether, five years after graduation. Well, I started my career uh, in the military as an active duty army nurse. Mm -hmm. And I worked there for three years in labor and delivery. Uh, and when I was discharged, I started as a clinical faculty for about two years and then went on um, for the master's degree, but continued to work at least one day a week in a labor and delivery unit. And, um, and about three years later started my PhD. And by that time I was doing home visiting uh, types of clinical practice. Um, I don't ever think I left practice. Even now as an associate dean, I practice 30% every week. So that's about a day and a half. I manage our uh, nurse clinics that the School of Nursing um, maintains. So it's an active faculty practice and we have students involved and uh, volunteer physicians and we provide free care to the uh, residents of the community um, that the Hopkins um, Medical Enterprise serves. And I'm also a clinical consultant for our local health department. Oh, <clears throat> my uh, clinical working experience, I can say uh, two parts. First part, uh, when I finished my uh, BSN program in Korea, I worked at the hospital one year. And then I went to America and worked 15 years at the hospital and the nursing home and wellness center. After I got the doctoral degree, I came back to Korea. Even though it's not the clinical area, but always continuously working with a master's program student and doctoral student and to get the research together or guiding together. I mean, working together. So that means, the clinical means is not only a hospital, I believe. Nursing practicum area, always I can contribute for a clinical area for nursing research, I believe. That's it. Um, I worked as a public health nurse and a visiting nurse for four years before I went back and received my master's in public health and as a family nurse practitioner. I was immediately recruited into teaching, not because I was so wonderful, but because they had very few NPs with a master's degree. So that's how I got into my teaching career. But my research has always been very public health based in the community. And I do the histories and physicals on all the participants in my study, which I feel keeps me in touch uh, with my nurse practitioner roots. And I really practiced two weeks ago in the Dominican Republic for the first time probably, full time for one week, where I worked with students uh, seeing low income people in the Dominican Republic. And that was a true challenge. But so I, I try to keep up my public health. 
and I'm also trained as a family nurse practitioner. Uh, and for almost 30 years, I had a joint appointment that was 50% academic and 50% clinical. So my research and was very much driven by the clinical questions and probably everyone knows HIV uh, is an area that, that's constantly uh, evolving. So um, it's just really been a, a great privilege uh, to have the uh, opportunity to continue to care for patients, which is what we do as nurses best, but also to use our uh, intellectual skills, which uh, is also very satisfying. So, and I continue to practice. I practiced uh, for a few months, actually, between my uh, bachelor's degree uh, completion and moving to the University of Washington in Seattle to study for a master's degree. I was very interested in the possibility of acute care and uh, graduated from my undergraduate program in Wisconsin, University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire, um, when the local critical care unit consisted of a room with two beds but only one cardiac monitor. So <laughs> I, I found um, uh, some real wonderful opportunity in graduate study and intended to go back and make that my career. And um, I completed graduate study and practice in neuroscience nursing. And then because of a move to the East Coast following my husband's career, I ended up practicing in uh, a hospital, Yale New Haven Hospital, um, where I worked with the continuing care unit, which was a nurse managed unit inside the acute care hospital. It was modeled after Loeb Center at Montefiore Hospital, Lydia Hall's um, nurse led model in the US, very influential. And I worked as a, a public health nurse inside the hospital, making rounds in the hospital, uh, helping to identify people who were not being discharged from the hospital because they had multiple chronic illnesses, is this sounding familiar? And um, many of the multiple chronic illnesses had led to uh, conditions that made it very difficult for people to live independently. So part of that practice involved visiting <clears throat> care facilities all around the state of Connecticut and doing uh, assessments of the facilities to uh, make sure that the environments to which we were discharging people actually were capable of supporting the level of care that they needed. And then doing follow-up home visits or visits to uh, places where people had been discharged to evaluate the adequacy of the discharge plans to give feedback to a team who helped plan the care for these very complicated um, situations for people with very complex, multiple chronic, um, diseases and uh, to create what then became um, the pilot project for um, Connecticut Blue Cross Blue Shield's first home care program. So it was a, a very interesting melding of practice with a bit of research and then some policy changes that actually changed how people were cared for. Now, you might wonder how I got connected to the field of women's health, which seems like a bit of a, um, a gap um, in my practice preparation. And there are really two profound practice-related experiences I had that led me to be very troubled by the health care available to women at the time. I cared for uh, a young woman who had been beaten by her husband, um, <clears throat> who nearly lost her life in the process, and after months of being hospitalized, was being discharged. And as I watched her leave the hospital, I found she was being pushed out of the hospital in her wheelchair by her husband, who had nearly caused her death. And um, I felt at that time especially um, helpless and distressed in watching that situation and realizing that the society at the time was not um, geared to supporting people, supporting women who had been victims of violence, and feeling um, that it was really necessary to devote some more energy and, and um, effort to correcting the situation in women's health care. I also had a, an experience in working with women with breast cancer later on when I had moved to Duke University um, that led to appreciating that, the, that what we knew about women who had survived five years after a breast cancer experience, back in a period during which the survival time was very limited, um, 
was, was uh, really framed in some ways that didn't reflect women's own experiences. So it was really those clinical experiences that um, caused me to um, always feel some discomfort about the way that we were delivering services to women and hoping to do something, um, which actually in my career turned out to be research, that I hope would contribute to changes in women's health care and work that would inform clinicians about how to care for women uh, in ways that were more appropriate. Well, thanks to all of you for that introduction. And now I have a number of other questions. I won't, we won't be able to hear from everyone because of our limited time, but I'll ask them in sort of a random fashion. Um, first, I'd like to hear about some strategies you've used to bridge the gap between your research and the world of practice. Um, Dr. Dunbar, would you speak to that? Sure. Um, I think that's a great question because sometimes we um, conduct our studies and then we publish them in research journals and places that um, might not be readily available to those most needing that type of information. So I think um, some strategies include uh, presenting at clinical conferences um, and definitely taking research findings back to uh, the practice setting where they were generated. So having a round table with um, the staff and showing, for example, um, the impact of additional education and uh, transitional care planning for families and the impact that might, that has on then the readmission rates that they're so worried about and especially in this day and time. And I'll just give you an example. We had um, a, a time when we worked with patients who received implantable cardioverter defibrillators and this was at the time when these devices were uh, evolving very quickly and they were um, changing in terms of the parameters of the device and the things that we needed to be teaching patients and yet some of the clinical staff were not really aware that these changes were <coughs> happening and so being able to take findings from studies back in and, and show these are the things that patients are asking for greater preparation on and this is what they're saying their experiences are like and if we can put that into their preparation we might have a better um, impact on their outcome. So those are just some, <coughs> some examples. You good examples? Um, how about Dr. Ricard, could you speak to that question? Any strategies you've used to connect? Yeah, sure. I mean, in our group, which is all about intravascular access devices, we, well, we really believe there is no gap between <laughs> our research and, our pract and the practitioners because uh, we have over 60 uh, members of our research group in Australia and they're spread all over Australia and most of them are based in hospitals. And we meet every month in the hospital. We video conference. Obviously, Australia is a big place. Um, and I think the questions that we answer really come from the IV nurses, from the infection control people, and really they seek out our expertise to then work with them to do the clinical research. And the methodologies we use are always driven by patient outcomes and you know, nurse-sensitive actual indicators like costs and nursing time, as well as the infection rates and so on. So um, they give us a lot of feedback and they help us to work out right from the start how we should design our studies with them that, so that they're feasible and practical and they'll actually be used at the end of the day. So I hope there's no gap, <laughs> maybe just a little one. Okay, now I'm gonna ask you all to think back to um, early in your experience as a researcher. And I'd like to know, was there a person or a situation that inspired you to pursue a research career? Dr. Arroyan? Rather interesting you should ask me that because I'm not going to have a conventional answer because I really fell into research by accident. I had um, a strong <coughs> clinical identity and I decided to pursue my PhD because I had also fallen into some teaching and decided that I liked that. And I knew I needed a PhD from an institution that was far from where I currently was working, and I was working in Boston. So I kind of picked Seattle just because I thought I've always wanted to live there. And I would say that it was probably the most fortunate, serendipitous choice of my life because I landed in a place that was extremely highly rated, some of the people on this stage were my mentors and my professors. Um, another missing person was one of my classmates, someone who didn't make it here today. 
and it was a wonderful experience. I really got excited about research by working on their research projects, and I think I always had the kind of questioning mind for research, so I landed in the right place, and I've never regretted that path, although I would say that um, it took me probably about 10 years post-graduation to um, get over the fact that I had a really strong identity as a clinician that didn't in initially didn't include one as a researcher. So I had to come around to it from the back end. And it was really a function of being so excited and so jazzed up, because I would say that the most fun I had in my entire PhD program was doing my own dissertation research. It's so exciting. <laughs> Some of you are laughing um, <laughs> because maybe you're struggling with that at the moment, but I was so excited to finally be able to research with live study participants the answers to questions that I probably was carrying around my almost my entire lifetime. Very good. Dr. Lei? My, uh, actually, I, I graduated from Nanjing Taiwan University uh, many years ago, almost 30 years ago. And uh, I was uh, deeply influenced by my, uh, my mentor, Professor Yu uh, Mei Yu. And she's kind of very uh, person, personal oriented, uh, very good professor, and also a mentor to me. So I keep this, uh, so I keep this in mind is uh, I want to be a nurse to take care of patients and in deeply caring their heart and their problems. But however, when I worked in the hospital, I found nurses have many, many uh, time working with patients. However, in the hospital's level, nurses on, the, nurses always the least person being involved in the major committees. So I feel we need to do something to change this. And I found we have many, many stories about patients, but we don't have a, a systemically, a systemic record of research about patients' problem about how to intervene this problem. So I want to do some research to know some skills. That's the reason that major motivation I, I, I after I go, I start to my master. So I went to University of Pennsylvania and I met Dr. Ruth McCoco again. And she's very kind of, uh, very kind of clinical oriented person and also very strong researcher. So I learned both. And also when I come back to Taiwan four years later during the clinical work, I have similar effect. Uh, feeling like uh, I still want to do research to really uh, know more skills to connect this problem and do the intervention. So I went to, after the situation by Ruth Makoko, I went to University of uh, North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and met uh, Merle Michelle and also Dr. Barbara Germino and also Dr. Jerome Dalton and also uh, Margie Sandrowski. And they are very strong researchers. So this is kind of a process that reinforced my learning. And I feel, I, I feel this is very important. I want to uh, put the research and clinical practice and education together, particular clinical practice and the research together. And so this is a kind of very good training. So I, I feel that teachers have, and researchers have a very good reinforce to others. So I, I cherish my position now to influence my, my students too. Thank you. Great. Uh, let's see, who else? Dr. Rispel? Um, my, uh, my previous professor of nursing at the University of Cape Town um, got me back into as a faculty member, um, initially as a junior lecturer and to do clinical instruction in particular. And she, um, I think she wanted to contain me and she wanted to make sure that I didn't have any time for rebellious activities. <laughs> So she, she said to me, why don't you go and do a postgraduate degree in epidemiology and biostatistics? Mm. And, and that's, of course, what launched my career then in public health research. So it's probably one of the best things. That, um, and I'll be eternally grateful um, to her. Although at the time, I don't think the intention was to teach me research skills. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, our next question is for Dr. Chan and for Dr. Heitkamper. Um, what do you consider the most important characteristics of a researcher? Yeah, this is a very good question, yeah. <laughs> of course, hard work, hard work, and hard work, yeah. <laughs> you need to put 200% of your effort uh, in your work to make it a success. 
But apart from that, uh, I believe uh, resilience is very important and not afraid of failure and rejection. Because throughout our research career, we encounter so many rejections of our grant proposal, so many rejections <laughs> of our manuscript submission. And uh, when we conduct a study, the result may not come out as we expected. So we need to accept it and uh, improve ourselves and move on. I believe that's very important. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Ditto, everything that you said. So let me just add, I also think having a solid group of collaborators and treating them like gold. Because, uh, I mean, I've had the personal experience of having the same research technician for 25 years, the same group of collaborators for years. I look at Dr. Woods and think about the importance that she's had as, in my career as a team member. So reaching out, be bold, be persistent, and I agree, get used to rejection because <laughs> it happens. So. Okay, next question we want to hear from Susan Gennaro and from Dr. Shin. Um, what do you think will enable novice researchers to publish successfully? <laughs> Why? The yeah. English major. <laughs> you know, we try, um, as the editor of the Journal of Nurse and Scholarship, we try to do a lot of um, workshops and things for novice researchers, but I think that it's really that team that, that Peg was talking about that becomes the most important thing. Because you get rejected so much, it makes it easier if, if you have some people that you trust that you can work with to begin with so that by the time you're submitting manuscripts, you really know it's better than it was just on your own. There's only one manuscript that I've ever submitted without having a group of people read it for me. And that was because my mother was very sick at the time and I just it was taking very long to get in and I just let it go. And thankfully, the editor was very kind and sent it back and said, you know, work on it a little more and then submit it. And, and it wound up being okay. But it's, it's that pre-work that I think is so important. So having other people who don't necessarily have to be nurses. I mean, you know, my family has been, hi, family. <laughs> There's a little shout out, they're not paying attention. Um, <laughs> has been great about reading things and saying this paragraph makes no sense to that paragraph. I don't understand what this word means. I think this grammar, you know, like the grammar police, this grammar is really wrong. And so it makes everything you're doing look a lot better because I think reviewers a lot of times, unfortunately, get stuck in the grammar, get stuck in the wording, get stuck in things that really aren't necessarily about the science. So it's having things as polished as possible and then sending it to the best place you think and knowing that rejection is a good, healthy thing. We all experience it, we all have it in common, you might as well too. <laughs> Dr. Shin? Yeah. Uh, I think uh, there is no shortcut to research. We have to do trial and error many, many times. So I believe there is uh, no you know, shortcut. So we have to do every day. Uh, this is my experience. I read a lot of uh, research articles to make, uh, you know, comfortably first. And then uh, I found uh, a sample of uh, article to follow up same way like that. And then, you know, did, uh, also the third one, I worked with uh, some good researcher together. And she can show me step by step. That was very, you know, helped for me. Very good. All right, so and now we want to hear what strategies do you recommend um, for jump-starting a research career? Uh, Dr. Champion, can you speak okay. to that? <laughs> um, I think one of the most important things for jump-starting is to identify early what your focus is going to be. Uh, realize that you're going to get further ahead if you build on what you've started. And um, have a colleague and mentor who both encourage you. I had a colleague at, that started when I did, and we were almost in competition, but we supported each other. So uh, there was always that edge that we you know, wanted to, to be ahead of the other person, but yet supported each other. So um, I think focus, too. Okay. How about um, 
Dr. Corbinpool, speak to that. Ditto. I think <laughs> a, a very important aspect to become a, a accredited research is to have focus and stay with that focus and do your research in depth. And I also believe to have an academic partner, which I have, and teams to work in. Together you can really do more rig rigorous research and you publish it also easier. Very good. So since our organization is committed to becoming more intentionally global, what can we do to facilitate collaboration among nurse researchers around the globe? Uh, Dr. Chan. I believe the STTI has a very important part to play. At present, we've got so many uh, chapters around the world. Uh, we know that uh, each chapter had a lot of activities, but it would be good if STTI can play a sort of, uh, more important role in coordinating uh, the research work in each chapter. At least we uh, create a database so that each chapter can uh, sort of uh, upload the uh, research themes or the research project that the members are engaging in mm -hmm. so that uh, other chapters in different parts of the world uh, will know the activities. So it can facilitate coordination and collaboration among the chapter members. Very good. Dr. Kirk, can you speak to that? Yeah, I think it's important to leverage other networks as well. So of course, there's a WHO collaborating centers uh, for nursing and midwifery around the world. So I think we always need to join forces and certainly SGTI is well positioned with the chapter structure and obviously the, the support. I guess I would also say that we really should not lose um, the focus of being very inclusive. So we all, uh, all of us here have some academic connection, the university, network globally is a wonderful sort of um, natural home for many of us, but let's not forget how many nurses are working um, in, you know, school, uh, ministries of health, uh, national health services, and those are really also natural networks and, and where they often don't get the opportunities that we do as academics to get the latest science, to have access to journals, et cetera. So I think we want to think about leadership training and um, research, um, you know, capacity building for uh, nurses um, in those settings as well. Great suggestion. Uh, let's see, Dr. Williams. Well, obviously I second everything that folks have said, but I would also say some of the principles that we talked about in terms of building a research career really make sense in terms of building an international career. Mm -hmm. So no matter <coughs> what country you're coming from, um, you wanna focus, you wanna follow your passion, so you wanna have a passion for the the topic that you're studying, but you also want to have a passion and a connection for the, uh, for the country with which you are partnering. Uh, whether you're a, um, a Chinese nurse who's gonna conduct some research in Los Angeles, uh, which happens, or you're an American nurse who's uh, wanting to do some work in Ukraine. Um, you can't just uh, do this quickly. It really takes time. And we're very privileged as nurses because we can go anywhere in the world and meet other nurses. And even if we can't speak their language, we recognize what they're doing and they recognize us. So we really have very natural, deep connections around the world. And that's what, for me, uh, a research career can be built on those connections. Great. Okay, so now on a lighter note, we want to hear about some of the amusing or interesting experiences you've had as a researcher. Uh, let's start with Dr. Richmond. Oh, for God's sake. <laughs> <laughs> um, amusing or interesting? Um, I would say a couple things. One um, occurred when I was a doctoral student and collecting data for my dissertation. And you know, you want all your like forms to be precise and little boxes to check off, et cetera. And I enrolled over 100 patients into my dissertation study, and I'm doing demographics, which is, you know, you think is really easy, and I had male and female, and I had a subject who was in the middle of a sex change operation. <laughs> and this was a long time ago, and I wasn't, I was, you know, I finally, after that situation, said, I learned a lot, and I said, you know, what, what do you consider yourself? I just started asking that of people. So it was sort of both amusing, but, but broadening for me in terms of how do I think more broadly. Um, and I would say the other amusing thing is I do a lot of um, research on violence and gun mm -hmm. violence, which is actually quite a political issue in the United States. So it's not a very easy area to work in. But I enroll, I, at any given time, I probably have a lot of um, 
individuals in my study who are not the most upstanding people in our society. <laughs> and um, so I deal a lot with, and I do longitudinal follow-up, and I'm a wonderful longitudinal follow-up person, but I have subjects who go in and out of jails very frequently. So uh, uh, the one good thing about being a nurse is I'll call and to do a follow-up, and I'm very good at tracking people down. And one subject I called multiple times, and finally, I'm not sure who the man was who answered the phone, but he said, well, wait a minute, are you the nurse? I said, absolutely, I'm the nurse. <laughs> oh, well, then I can tell you where he is. <laughs> and I said, that is great, because I really need to talk to him. And he goes, well, he's in jail. <laughs> But I don't give up because you can be in and out of jail relatively quickly, I, gar I guarantee you. So I said, well, how long do you think he's going to be there? Because when can I follow up? And he goes, oh, ma'am, he murdered somebody. <laughs> and it wasn't he was alleged or he was charged. Yeah. He murdered somebody. So it's not going to be any time soon. So that, <laughs> nothing in my doctoral program prepared me for that. Very good. Dr. Sharps? I was hoping I would get this question because I have a, an incident. I um, work with uh, pregnant women most of my research, and um, we were doing a big research initiative in the nation's capital, and we were preparing our questionnaires and making sure the responses were culturally sensitive and uh, appropriate. And so we got to when we asked, we have a series of questions we asked the woman about her intimate partner. And I said, oh, we should just leave it as intimate partner. And the developmental psychologist on the team said, Phyllis, these are pregnant women. It's going to be a he. And I said, well, not necessarily. And she argued, and we argued back and forth. And because I, I don't like confrontation, I deferred to her. So we went into the field. And about three days later, at our research team meeting, the psychologist comes in, and she says, Oh my God, Phyllis, you were right. We had a woman come in, and um, and I was asking the questions, and I said he, and she said uh, Sally, my partner, and she said I just didn't know what to say, and I said, and I said well I'm not going to say I told you so, but uh, we then had to proceed to change all of our research questionnaires to partner. Very good. Lesson learned. Dr. Wilbur, you got one. Um, well, the incident that happened with us was fairly recently. We were collecting data. We always collect data on, the sat on Saturdays out in the community. And my whole team arrived bright and early in the morning to start data collection. And they got to the door, and the guard was there and said, the running of the bulls is today. And the streets are all going to be run, uh, closed down. And so they madly got out their cell phones, were calling up the subjects to tell them, please don't come because it's going to be closed down. In the meantime, people were coming out of the woodwork, barriers were going up, the police were arriving, and they were locked in. And they said it'll be about five hours before you can get out of here. <laughs> and one of my uh, team members who is very community oriented from the community, she said, we are leaving. I know the way. And she started a little caravan through the back alleyways. And when she ran into barriers, she'd lift the barrier up, move it out of the way. <laughs> she ran into a policeman. She spoke to him, sweet-talked him, and she got four or five of our cars out of there. And they didn't have to wait around to the end of the running of the bulls. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. OK, so for our last question, I want to ask a few of you, what are the most important life lessons you've learned as a researcher? Dr. Woods? Oh, goodness. Um, there are many of them, but probably one of the most important uh, in reflecting on, on uh, the work that I've done in women's health is the importance of listening to what women themselves tell you. Um, one of the greatest complaints women have of their health care, um, and this has remained the top ranked complaint since probably the early 1970s, is uh, providers' failure to take their concerns seriously. And I think that uh, we try to build that into our studies so that after we finished an initial interview with a woman, we would ask her, what have we not asked you that we really should have asked you? Is there anything else you want to tell us that um, we didn't ask you about? And then we also ask them, what is it that you hope we would learn and that you could learn as a result of being in this study? And some of the questions women have asked us have actually 
become very important in framing what we did in the context of the study. For example, one of the things I'll talk about this afternoon is, is um, the experience of the menopausal transition. And one of the most commonly asked questions in our work is, when is this going to be over? <laughs> um, and so we took that question along with some you know, research considerations that we had about creating a system for staging where women were in the process. And we used their ideas about that to inform how we approach the research. Excellent. Dr. Shin? Well, I can say the researching is not only academic research, I believe. It is my, uh, I can look at the, my, you know, the, the life through the research process. And also because the qualitative research I usually do means is uh, the other people's perspective views. And then I always say what, what I did before like that, always looking back my thinking process. Mm -hmm. And also, secondly, I learned from research. Research is, researching process is, very is uh, the, what is it, the, show the principle of life. Because when I spend the time and effort, how much, you know, I can spend it, the quality of uh, research outcomes came out. That means it's most significantly the, time and effort and the outcomes is related, I learned. So mm -hmm. the researching is not, you know, just academic things. It is the life process. Very good. Dr. Pokenpo? I think the most important lesson I've learned is to have the courage to be imperfect. <laughs> 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 and you plan uh, oh, research yes. projects and you think, wow, this is going to be great, and then things start to happen. Life starts to happen. And for the project yourself and your team members, and even the participants, it's important to remember you can plan, but it's not necessary how it's going to happen. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Dr. Heitkamper? I think the notion that in research you can't stand still, that Things happen, but that science moves forward, and you have to be flexible, and you have to keep learning. You have to learn new methods, new approaches. You have to stay contemporary. And I think that is the lesson, that um, it is the passion that goes with it, that I lay awake at night thinking, what about this? What if? What can I do? How can I measure it? and that energy that it takes. And I guess that just becomes a lifestyle when you do research. Dr. Dunbar? I think everything that you've said has just been so right on. Um, I think, you know, your question was what life lessons have you learned? And, and one of the things is that, is that whole notion of having things well planned and then it doesn't go the way you think. And, you know, I, I thought if you asked me that, question about an interesting experience. I remember having a group of patients who were at risk for sudden death in a support group, and then I see, uh, then we had a code in the room next door. And so all of these patients um, who were at risk were witnessing um, a resuscitation until we could get over there and get the door shut. And you, th and you think to yourself, oh, this is supposed to be a, a stress reduction group. <laughs> and, you know, this, uh, but it, it, it helped us generate some discussion among the, the participants that was useful for them. Um, but so, the, so that whole thing about um, things can't be controlled and you know, we're doing clinical research, these are, and so it, it becomes messy at times and you just track things and hope that, um, that it comes out. And then the other point is that I think balance is a myth. <laughs> so maybe across the lifespan, maybe across that three to five years, you achieve it. Um, but somewhere along the way, there are moments of, of great fun. And um, I think my daughter and husband have been to more Sigma Theta Ta and AHA conferences so that we can, can spend time together, um, <laughs> even though you're engaged in other, other important activities for your research. 
Well, I think that's a good note to end on. So I, I've certainly enjoyed hearing from all of you, and I know our participants have as well. Would you please give them one more round of applause? Well, thanks for, uh, to Dr. Prevo and our honorees. And as they leave the podium, let's continue our applause once more for the induction. <laughs>